Welcome to Wisconsin DNR's Wild Wisconsin Off the Record Podcast. Information straight from the source. another episode of Wisconsin DNR's Wild Wisconsin Off the Record podcast. So for anyone listening, as a reminder, this gives us as DNR staff an opportunity to give you, the listener, kind of an inside look at work done by DNR staff and our partners. We've got a few few great partners here today that really connects to how all of you enjoy kind of the natural resources that Wisconsin has to offer. So without further ado, today we're, we'll be talking about the voluntary public access and Habitat Incentive Program. So for anyone wondering what the heck is that, we're going to get into it. Um, I think it's going to be really interesting, especially for people who enjoy using Wisconsin's public land and also uh, landowners who are looking to earn some more cash. So I'm Sawyer Briel. I work for the Fish, Wildlife, and Parks Division. We've also got Eric Barber, who is the DNR Social Media Coordinator. We've got Ann Rice, who is the DNR Voluntary Public Access and Habitat Incentive Program Coordinator. Tim Lazat, who is a DNR Public Land Specialist, John Lindeman, a volunteer and VPA user, Kathy Hansen, a VPA landowner, and Cheyenne Weller, who is a DNR Public Access Liaison. So we're going to give you both sides, both sides of the coin here. We've got DNR staff who work directly with the program. They're going to tell you what the program is, why it's important, and we've also got a landowner and a user who are going to tell you why the, why the program is important to them, both from enjoying public lands and from as a landowner maybe getting getting some income while also giving people an opportunity to enjoy public lands. So before we get started we'll, we're just going to do a real brief kind of background of who we've got today. So we'll start with you Tim. Uh, what's your experience in the outdoors and kind of elevator speech of what BPA means to you from a DNR perspective? Hey Sawyer. Uh, for me I'm an avid hunter and fisherman and uh, ever since I can remember no one had to ride a bike I had my fishing pole strapped across the handlebars and I was pedaling to any creek, river, or lake where I could do some fishing and really kind of forged my connection to nature there. Later on uh, I became a hunter and uh, moved to Wisconsin and very interested in hunting, fishing, uh, and all forms of outdoor recreation. I don't own any land and for me the VPA is one of the great ways that the department can provide outdoor recreational opportunities to uh, everyone, regardless of financial means, whether they own land or not, they've got a place to go recreate. Uh, and we also know that lack of access to land uh, is an impediment to uh, hunting and fishing. So providing these lands helps uh, people get out and connect with nature. Mm -hmm. And how about you? What's, what's your experience in the outdoors and kind of what's your connection to BPA other than working at DNR? Sure. So um, I'm more of a passive use type of person, but one of my passions in life is to connect people to nature and outdoor recreation, whether it's, you know, hunting for locally sourced trout or venison or spending time watching birds or identifying bugs and plants in the prairies. So when I enroll a new property, I'm really excited for landowners and users alike. Many landowners mentioned how they liked meeting new people or are happy knowing that others get to enjoy their little piece of earth. Mm -hmm. The users have a new proper to explore and connect with, and our modern life is filled with stressors, and the more time we can spend outside, the better our collective mental and physical health, and that's why VPA is important to me. Yeah, I think that's a really good perspective that we're going to touch on as we keep going here. Um, Cheyenne, how about you? So, so I grew up on a farm um, my entire life, so I've been around land pretty much all the time. So one nice thing about the VPA program is it gets landowners um, out there sharing their land with other people, which I think is a kind of nice thing to do around Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Eric, how about you? For anyone who is a listener to the program, um, Eric has 
moderate passion for deer hunting. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe moderate to high. Can you can you touch on your experience in the outdoors there? Yep. Uh, kind of like Sawyer said, um, I grew up in a diehard deer hunting family. And, uh, you know, for me as a kid, that's how I started deer hunting was on public land. And like you mentioned, Tim, you know, access to properties to hunt or fish or recreate, whatever the case may be, is always something that keeps people from you know, f fulfilling their passion. So that's why I really look to look at the VPA program as an awesome incentive for people. And, uh, you know, myself, I'm someone who is always looking for a place to hunt or fish, and that's why I'm kind of here today, so. John, how about you? Uh, so you're a volunteer and VPA user. Can you give maybe some perspective of your experience in the outdoors and how that might connect to VPA? You know, I started out fishing as well. I was, I was riding my bike before school taking a few uh, casts at the put-and-take trout and then coming back home and catching the bus. Um, that grew into some serious fishing with friends, and they were hunters. So they got me into the turkey hunting thing about 10 years ago. And ever since then, it's been I've been going crazy for hunting. And I didn't know there was trouble with access to land until I became a turkey hunter. So looking on the DNR website, I found this program, and... Uh, the rest is history as far as my volunteer goes. Mm -hmm. So when so when you're described as a volunteer, so what exactly does that mean relative to the program? Well, let's see. I, I visit all the properties. I repair signs, um, police the area, pick up a lot of stuff. Spring is really good time for that. All the snow reveals a lot of stuff. So I fill up a lot of garbage bags. Um, and then I also go through and visit the land as long as I'm there. So mm -hmm. I do a little scouting, see what's on the property. Mm -hmm. um, uh, ju just being an ambassador, mm -hmm. um, I answer questions if somebody, the landowners come out sometimes and ask what I'm doing, so I explain. I started wearing a uh, reflective vest that always, for some reason, makes you official. So <laughs> they approach me uh, with a smile instead of you know, wondering what I'm doing there. But... Uh, um, explain what's going on. Sometimes they have questions and I answer them and uh, try to, you know, keep a positive light on mm -hmm. the program. So for anyone who uses VPA properties in public lands, you've got people like John to thank who are out there kind of going the extra mile. It's not something they'd have to do, but when you don't see trash out there or anything like that, it's people like John that are kind of impro improving the experience for everyone. And we're going to touch on that a little more. Um, so Kathy, how about you as a landowner in the VPA program? What's your connection to the outdoors and kind of what VPA means to you? Well, I'm a lot like Cheyenne. She was grew up on a farm. I grew up on a farm. I'm I'm totally all about living in the country and, and sharing that kind of experience with other people. I think living in the city is for the birds. But you know, um, so I you know, I don't have a problem sharing what I have our with the farmland, and I think it's great to have that opportunity to be to, to let others that don't have access, like John, if he lives in a town or a city that you know you want to get out and do oh yeah that kind of stuff. Sure, you know, so I'm I'm there to participate and be a part of that. So more good perspective. So like I've mentioned earlier, we've got DNR staff, we've got volunteers, we've got VPA land users, we've got a landowner in the program. Um, so hopefully that'll give you some perspective when we're all kind of discussing these issues. So before we get into kind of the nuts and bolts of, of what it means to kind of everyone at the table, for Ann, Ann and Tim and Cheyenne, you can chime in too, obviously. Uh, what is the VPA program? What's your 30,000 foot view for someone who may not be kind of familiar with the program? So the VPA HIT program, or the Voluntary Public Access and Habitat Incentive Program, on a nationwide level is uh, really a program that expands public access opportunities for wildlife dependent recreation. Uh, federal studies have shown that one of the main barriers for hunters is the lack of access to quality public access lands and VPA addresses this need. Uh, the program helps to re recruit, retain, and re-engage people in outdoor recreation. Tim, do you want to touch on that too? Sure. Um, no, I'm the public uh, lands coordinator for the wildlife management program and I see firsthand that uh, the amount of resources it takes for the department to own uh, and manage lands. 
And certainly at the core of the DNR mission is providing outdoor recreation for all of the citizens. And we try and do that uh, through purchase and management of lands. But uh, with limited resources, uh, the VPA program is very important because it complements the core holdings of DNR lands. And uh, people like Ann and Cheyenne, when they are uh, recruiting new landowners, often focus on existing public hunting grounds, state forests, other areas where we can uh, partner with our neighbors, uh, forge a good working relationship, and really expand the, the size and the opportunities uh, on those adjacent lands. So it's really a very good complementary program to, uh, to core land ownership. Um, the other important point is that the land remains privately owned, uh, so the landowner retains the right to pay taxes, uh, but they also retain those rights to manage the land as they wish, whether that is harvesting timber, growing crops, uh, or any other land management activities. Really, the department staff, um, Cheyenne uh, and her uh, counterparts will go out and they'll post the land, put up user surveys, and works uh, hard here in central office to make sure the maps are on the internet, and our wardens will help uh, enforce hunting and fishing laws out on the property. So it's really cool because it's a partnership between the DNR and private landowners, and I think that's why it's really successful. And I think an important point to drive home there, too, is there's something in it for everyone. Um, it's not just users getting a place to hunt. It's not just private landowners maybe getting some extra cash and the ability to manage that land as they would have anyway. There's kind of something in it for everyone, which in today's day and age has become fairly rare, I think, overall. I don't know. I think that's fair to say, but Tim, I think you had a, a really good point there, too. So the VPA HIP program... Um, it's a big program, there's a connection to USDA, so obviously there's a federal connection. So how is the program funded? Yeah, so uh, like uh, Tim said, it is a partnership program. Um, the funding comes from the U.S. Department of Agriculture Natural Resources Conservation Service, or NRCS. And uh, the 2014 Farm Bill, Federal Farm Bill, authorized $40 million for the states to run these programs. And Wisconsin DNR received $1.3 million uh, to implement the program in 2016. Most states actually have a similar program. So uh, places like Minnesota, Iowa, and Michigan, as our nearest neighbors, all have a program like this. Um, so what it looks like on the ground in Wisconsin is that private landowners earn extra, earn extra income through the lease payment to open their lands, and users earn um, have additional 32,000 acres on 228 mapped properties in southern, in the southern two-thirds of Wisconsin um, for hunting, fishing, trapping, and wildlife observation. That, and that's an awesome point right there. That, that's an additional 32,000 acres of public opportunities that I think a lot of people really aren't aware of. I mean, we're always trying to do different outreach efforts to get people up to speed on that. But, you know, to the average... Uh, user of public lands, you know, people think that we're limited to, you know, what we see on, you know, potentially the PALS Atlas or, you know, what we see is posted when we're driving the road. But I think when, when people realize that there's another resource out there using that, the map system that you just kind of mentioned, that allows our users to tap into a whole other resource of, you know, recreation opportunity. So for people listening, um, that's kind of a background on the program, and farm, the Farm Bill was mentioned. So, Tim, why is that important to the program overall, and what's the connection there? So for someone who has no knowledge of the Farm Bill, uh, what is it? The Farm Bill is really a super broad-reaching uh, federal legislation that covers everything from price supports on milk to uh, setting uh, quotas on how much certain... Uh, grains or produce are generated in a given year. Um, but one of the really important parts, the components of the Farm Bill has been its conservation aspect. And um, through programs such as the Conservation Reserve Program, Wetland Reserve Program that essentially um, pay landowners lease rates to take land out of production. Uh, usually those are highly erodible lands or really sensitive environmental lands that aren't uh, prime farmland anyway. Uh, so the Farm Bill has always included some really significant conservation aspects to it. And uh, certainly the VPA is something we were really happy with to see that included in 
our more recent farm bills and, and we're hoping that it'll be in the forthcoming farm bill as well because it's really it's really a, a great value for the citizen the public and the taxpayer when you consider our av you know our VPA rental rates uh, range from three to fifteen dollars an acre with an average cost in I don't know of what seven ten dollars an acre on an, on the average when you consider purchasing land in Wisconsin right now, the rates are anywhere from a thousand to tens of thousands of mm -hmm. dollars an acre, and when the farm bill helps us supplement that at a really good cost, it ends up being a, a great value. Mm -hmm. So, for anyone listening who uses public lands, um, notably VPA, enjoys public lands, the farm bill is kind of something you should be familiar with because it's extremely important both to the present and to the future of the VPA program and kind of, we mentioned it, an extra 32,000 acres of public land in Wisconsin. So um, if you aren't familiar, get familiar. Uh, we can share some links in the description to the Farm Bill if you want to get more familiar with it. So one thing that came up too is you've, you've mentioned it a little bit, Tim, but how are VPA lands different from other public access lands? So say um, I hunted a wildlife area during deer season. What would, would anything be different uh, for VPA if I would have done that? So how does it differ from kind of the typical public lands that we think of? Sure. So one of the first things that you'll notice when you're out at a property um, is that our signs are different. Uh, we have a sign that shows that we only lease for uh, activities, and that's hunting, fishing, trapping, and wildlife observation. And so our signs are different. They say private lands leased for public access. Um, so when you access a property, look out for those signs. The other thing that's different is that these are not owned by the DNR or even managed by the DNR. These are still private lands. The landowner still pays taxes on it. They are allowed to do uh, whatever they'd like to do uh, for managing their property, grow crops, harvest timber. Um, and so uh, those are, those are, we still have to respect landowners' rights when we access these properties. Mm -hmm. um, another thing too is when you go to public lands, you're typically allowed to harvest wild edibles or collect shed deer antlers. Um, sometimes you can camp or build campfires. None of that is allowed on VPA properties. Uh, those particular activities aren't leased um, in this case. So uh, when you approach a VPA property, always be mindful that there's only four activities allowed on them. So those are sort of the, the main differences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to, to add to that, I would say also, uh, given that hunting is a primary purpose of VPA lands, uh, our users should be um, aware that any portable blinds, tree stands, things like that um, can't damage any trees when they're erected and they need to be uh, packed in and packed out at the beginning and ending of each hunt. So mm -hmm. unless, of course, you did get the landowner permission, but absence of that, um, basically uh, leave no trace, pack in, pack out, whatever you bring in, mm -hmm. bring it out with you at the end of your hunt. Absolutely, and that's a, that's a really good point, which is, I think it's something that should be in the back of your mind no matter what type of public land you're on, but um, especially VPA, since the landowner was kind enough to kind of bring this land into the forefront for you to use, you should definitely be respecting the land that you use. And yeah. we'll, get, we'll get into that a little later with the Code of Conduct, but mm -hmm. Eric, I think you wanted to make a point. Yeah, too. you know, kind of going off that, Tim, you know, not damaging trees or the property. Same goes with picking up trash, whether it's yours or, or not yours. You know, a lot of hunters, myself included, kind of like to pride ourselves on being stewards of the land. And if you really want to, you know, ante up to that statement, I think it, it really you know, it speaks to going above and beyond. And, and if you see a water bottle or a, a soda can, whatever the case may be, don't walk past it, pick it up, put it in your backpack and, and bring it out with you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we mentioned being respectful to landowners and now we're gonna move right into kind of getting landowner perspective. And as we mentioned, we've got Kathy here. So uh, Kathy, why, why did you enroll in VPA? Well, other than being just a all-around excellent person that always does the right thing. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Well, this is actually a heritage kind of thing. My dad, this this farm um, that that I own has been in my family for over 100 years. And I am the last caretaker of this. So I, it, my dad enrolled in this program back in, I think Ann found out it was 1961 or something like that. So a long time ago. Um, I, so I grew up on that farm knowing that that's what happened. 
every fall it was a public hunting ground well it is all year long but you know when hunting season starts everybody knows about deer season because that's the only one that there is right um, <laughs> I'm a turkey guy. no that's right the turkey guys here um <clears throat> but it it just i grew up with that i didn't see anything wrong with it we never had any problem with people um you know every once in a while you'd see a car parked on the side of the road down the way and never had an issue with things mm -hmm. being left behind like you talk about trash mm -hmm. and stuff never had issues like that never had any problems with shooting too close to the house or you know to nothing i mean i have i i recall zero incidents that were bad mm -hmm. so so clearly not? clearly being in the program and the heritage part of it is is awesome but I mean, you could you could take your property out at any time. So can you kind of speak to why you haven't, other than the kind of the heritage issue? So what are your motivations for keeping the land in there? I It's been brought up a couple times, you guys talk about it, and I think it's just a good thing to do. It's, I'm, it's no skin off my nose if somebody's walking around down there. The crops are typically already removed when the majority of the hunters are coming out there, so the corn's picked. And now the turkeys are out there for the turkey guy to go <laughs> to go hunting in the cornfield. So I I don't see an issue with it. I think it's a great thing to share your land with, with the public and, and if they're respectful, mm -hmm. I don't have any issue with it at all. Yeah, and I know right now the the diehard deer hunters that own land specifically for deer hunting are thinking to themselves, well, this is something I would never do because I bought my land for one purpose and that's hunting. And that's not necessarily the point that we're trying to make here, I think, is, you know, there's two different kinds of landowners. There's people, you know, like in your case, that are, are you're not, look, you don't own your land specifically for a recreational activity. So you're, you're opening that opportunity up to those that enjoy that. And then there are other people, on the other hand, that want to own their 40 acres or whatever the case may be specifically for that purpose. And we're not saying one's better than the other, but I think that's just a, a, a good delineation to make is that we're not asking everybody to do this. We understand there's people that are or are not going to be warm to the idea. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, we're hoping that you listen to the podcast today and, and something might pique your interest or something might sound like a good fit for your property. Um, I think Kathy is a really good case of that. It sounds like the property's been in there for a long time. Uh, Kathy, can you kind of speak about you touched on it a little bit, but your experience with people who use the property, is it all types of ages, all types of hunting? Boy, that's tough, because I don't, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't live right next to the property anymore, so I, I really couldn't tell you. From what I do remember, when I do see things, it's, it's usually guys, of course. Um, it's usually guys in their 30s and 40s. I'd say maybe 50s. I, I, I really wouldn't know what to tell you. Well, I, th I think that's good because I've used VPA property too, um, and I've seen other people using it, and I've never had an issue. Uh, but I think it's just good for potential landowners moving into the program to get that perspective too. Um, obviously, Kathy can't speak for every landowner in the state, but... Um, it's been in the program for, like I said, since 1961. Long time. So, yeah. The other reason I, I did want to say, I just thought of this. The other reason I like to stay in the property is, or in the program, there's, I mean, I've grown up, you grow up in the country, you grow up in a small town, there's a lot of hunters, you grew up with all the kids that went hunting, and then your family that hunts and all of that. Um, and a lot of the guys that I know would talk about how you'd, you'd have to plan a whole weekend to go up north and go hunting and make it. It would be so nice if there was some place close by where just after work you had a couple hours to screw around and you could find something, you know, find some local guy that would let you hunt on his grounds. And uh, it, I heard that many times. So I thought, why don't more people do this? I really don't understand why more people don't do this because I have zero problems with mm -hmm. being in the program. John, I think you wanted to add something yeah, there too. As a volunteer, I'm out there year-round, so I've, I've noticed at the different properties in uh, the eastern side of the state where I'm at, um, I've noticed retired guys uh, walking their dogs, just 
observing nature on a leash and uh, start talking to them. We strike up a good conversation and they, I sneak in there, have you seen any turkeys? That kind of thing, so I get a little intel. Ulterior motives. Yeah, yeah there's guys like that. <laughs> there's also um, uh, uh, the younger guys that are just driving by, checking their property that they deer hunt on. So mm -hmm. they'll drive by, they'll stop, and I'll talk to them. Mm -hmm. um, so I've run into uh, quite a range of, of people. Um, I have left, if somebody's harvesting and they're working hard, I've left them alone. I, I, don't, <laughs> I won't take my intel that far. Mm -hmm. But uh, I leave them alone because they're, they're getting their work done. So I've run into quite a few different, a lot of age groups mm -hmm. out there. So John's got a really good perspective as a volunteer and a VPA user. So I think we can move into that portion now. And look, does anyone have anything else to add before we get into that? Well, I just wanted to say, too, based on our user feedback, most of the hunters are really local. They're traveling on average 20 miles to get to the properties. So, you know, these are your neighbors or people just from a town away that are coming in. And while we do have cases of, you know, folks coming from out of state or 100 miles away, you know, the majority of folks are traveling a very short distance. So these properties are really important to the local people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point to make, too. So, John, um, you're a volunteer, VPA user, turkey hunter. How did you find out about VPA? Man, I think I was uh, scouring the DNR website. I just, you get bored sometimes. So... Uh, <laughs> I just went to the website and I was looking at everything and um, uh, I think I was trying to find some extra ways to get extra tags to get turkey hunting and I, I came across a map, an interactive map, and that's where it took off really. I found the interactive map and um, all the information that's on, I think it's the public access map is the one that has a lot of information on it and I noticed these different types of properties. And um, the, I noticed the VAP prop, the VPA properties, and I went to check one out, and I I uh, found a survey, filled it out, and um, it went from there. So I, I, I noticed that somebody said uh, one of the web, one of the pages, I'm sorry, mentioned volunteer opportunities. So I clicked, and and that's how I got involved. So this is something that I was going to touch on later, but I think is the perfect time now, and something that's really going to hit home with people listening. So John, from the from the time that you found this on the internet, what was the time between that and having boots on the ground on a VPA property? It was just a, it was like a week. Yep. I uh, wasn't actually boots on the ground. I, uh, my wife, jumped in the car with me and we hit a bunch of spots. So she didn't want to go out walking at that time, and that was fine with me. I was checking out all kinds of spots. So. Mm -hmm. uh, she was kind of, she was videoing the properties as we went by just for fun. And uh, it's kind of funny because I went by one that I currently hunt on and it's, I sounded like Bill Murray, you know, the, and Caddyshack coming around the corner. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I've actually, I haven't got any turkeys there, but I've called them in and gotten close. But uh, so um, then I think it was the next weekend after that, I went out by myself and I started tromping around. Mm -hmm. So, um, so you've kind of hinted at it a little bit with the turkey talk, but how, how do you use VPA properties? How do I use them? Yep. Um, well, I hunt them. Um, I've even taken my uh, daughter out there. She gave her first experience um, hunting uh, this past, yeah, last year. Um, I use them to blow off steam to detox from a, a, a week of work in downtown Milwaukee, get out and walk around, um, see what I can see. In the winter, I'm looking for trails. Mm -hmm. it, you, you can always see something. In the summer, there's, uh, the, the, the farmers are out working, um, people are walking, you're running into people. Um, I use them, everything really, I, uh, mm -hmm. everything I can keep it up and up. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned you're a volunteer too. Is there a reason that you became a volunteer? Was it just recognition of how important the program had been to you? Uh, can you speak a little bit more on, on why you volunteered? Well, I guess it might, I don't want to get too deep, but... Uh, no, get, <laughs> get right it's, into it's it. It's a good way to detox. I can, 
Um, you know, you're alone with your thoughts when you're out there. Um, it feels good to clean up an area, to take care of a property that someone is like um, Kathy is willing to offer. It feels good to clean up after, uh, not, and it's not always hunters, just people driving down the road, throw the soda can out. So you're just taking care of an excellent resource. I love Wisconsin. Um, I don't own land, so I really appreciate this opportunity. Mm -hmm. And uh, it sometimes uh, it's a little disappointing when you hear people complaining. This the day of it's the the era of social media, so it's mm -hmm. either hot or cold. You're either super happy or you're upset. So I decided to do something about it. I'm out there walking around, having fun. Um, meeting nice landowners. Thank you very much. I said in my survey I'd shake the hand of a landowner. So well, for, any, for anyone listening, you're they welcome. just had a very cordial handshake. <laughs> <laughs> Hugs come off there. We're, we're seeing something very special right now. Sorry you can't see it. So I think it's all about perspective today. We've got the landowner, we've got someone who uses it, uses those properties. He's taking the time to volunteer. So, um, and Tim and Cheyenne, do you guys want to kind of talk about it's, it's called the Code of Conduct, but it kind of guides how people should use this land, what landowners might want to know going into it. So can you guys kind of talk about that? I think we'll start with, so what does, what does someone interested in using a VPA property need to know as far as Code of Conduct? Yeah, so I think one of the most essential things to do as a user um, of VPA properties is, is to review this Code of Conduct uh, before you head out. Um, and also take a look at our website, see which properties are active, uh, which are open to the public, download a map either onto your phone or uh, print out a map um, from, uh, on your personal printer, um, and just sort of prepare yourself to get out to uh, a property. Um, by the start of the turkey season this year, so I think that's April 4th, yes, April 4th okay. Um, we're hoping to have the code of conduct posted at uh, each of the properties uh, on our survey boxes. So they'll be right there for you uh, when you go out to visit. Um, so I guess the, the first thing that uh, we tell people to do is really to um, follow all hunting, fishing, trapping regulations. And you know, if you're unclear when things start, just visit one of our service centers, go to the web, the DNR website to get that information. So that's, that's sort of a no-brainer. Um, I don't know if anyone, uh, maybe Tim, do you want to follow up with the next one? Well, I guess one thing I would like to say that, that uh, more of like an overarching statement is that uh, these lease rates, landowners like Kathy are not getting rich off this program. They're, as we heard today, there's definitely an ethic. Uh, it's not a purely financial uh, incentive. And I think anyone using the properties should strive to be like John and consider these the same as lands you would that were in your family or a friend let you go out and hunt. And um, taking that same care will ensure that landowners like Kathy want to remain in the program because literally one bad interaction, and, and we've seen this in the program, and I hear Ann in the cube next door dealing with this when, you know, they are rare, but when it happens, uh, landowners are not afraid to pull out. And um, we don't, certainly don't want a user to be the cause of that happening. So uh, common courtesy, respect, uh, and treating the land uh, really well, I think, is going to go a long way to making sure the uh, program remains viable for the future. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have anything they want to add there for users? Well, I think we could just go quickly through the code of conduct. Um, make sure you're accessing areas that are posted uh, with VPA signs, so you got to know those boundaries. There's actually a whole bunch of apps that you can download um, in the App Store. Uh, they're like PDF map viewers. They help you navigate the property uh, while you're there, navigate the map while you're on the property, so you know those field boundaries and you don't trespass on other people's lands. Um, always access... Uh, Foot traffic only, so no vehicles, motor vehicles are allowed. Um, avoid, uh, as Kathy mentioned, damage to standing crops, um, and this includes our hunting dogs too, so when there are standing crops, stay, stay off those. Um, 
when we uh, need a place to park, we should park uh, along the shoulder of a public road or in a designated parking area. Um, and one of the top two complaints from our landowners this year is parking uh, in uh, farm access lanes and or driving down those farm lanes. Cheyenne, I think you just went out to a property to post a sign that said, please no vehicle access. Um, so paying attention to that, those two things are really important. Um, we leave gates as we find them. We don't want any livestock on the highway. That would be bad. Um, of course, maintaining a distance of 300 feet near farmsteads or buildings. Um, always uh, being mindful of tab K um, when we're using our firearms. Um, some other things to remember is that uh, really you guys, uh, the users have pre-permission. You don't uh, need to contact the landowner at all. You can just walk in to the site. So if you do have a question about a property, you should contact me as the BPA coordinator or Cheyenne down here in the southern part of the state as a uh, DNR um, BPA liaison. Um, and you can just search the web, uh, search BPA at dnr.wi.gov and all of our contact information is there. If there is some sort of violation, call the tip line at 1-800-TIP-WDNR. Um, also, I think Tim touched on this, you know, only portable structures are allowed on properties and trail cameras are not allowed, just as a FYI. And then also for dogs. So we, uh, we encourage you to take your dog to the dog park or to a specific training grounds. Dogs can be used for hunting purposes only on BPA lands. Um, and then of course, uh, try not to litter and if you do, make sure you, you take it with you when you go. Um, and then of course, be ethical, courteous, grateful, and safe when you're out there on the property. So those are sort of the main um, code of conduct rules that we ask everyone to follow. Uh, and this just helps ensure the longevity and sustainability of the program. And the reason I had asked John that question about boots on the ground earlier, if you could touch on it a little bit more. So when you find a parcel on the internet, you for anyone who's hunted out west, if, if you're looking up on a plat book, you're looking up phone numbers, you're trying to get the landowner's contact info, for VPA, not the case. So hypothetically, you could go on the VPA website, and if a parcel was, say, 10 minutes away from you, uh, you could get in the car and, and go straight to that property as long as you were following the rules. So Yes, that's correct. So yeah. I think that, that's something that would be appealing to yeah. a lot of people. All like, of the properties on the web are current and active. Um, they're the most up-to-date properties. Um, and as we add new properties into the program, we always make a note, you know, new property, um, uh, or if there's a termination. Sometimes we do get early terminations. We'll let people know how much longer they have um, to be able to access that property. Mm -hmm. So the website is your go-to place um, before you, you go out to a property. Mm -hmm. And even if you're there on the property itself, we have QR codes that users can scan and it'll take you directly to our website. So you can get the information you need at any time. Mm -hmm. So if, if you're driving by, you see a VPA sign, um, as a user, you don't need to go knock on the door. Is that, is that what I'm... That's correct. Okay. And the intent is for you not to contact yep. the landowner. Yep, and I think a lot of landowners would prefer that anyway. So that's something important to remember. You can go right out there um, and enjoy the property responsibly, and you, there's no interaction needed with that landowner. So kind of the flip side now, is there something that landowners should know um, regarding code of conduct? You kind of touched on it for the user and the... the the landowner should be at ease knowing that people are following that, but is there something, anything that you tell a landowner? Um, well, in general, if there are any problems, uh, we would ask them not to engage. We would ask them to call the warden right away um, to so that we can settle any disputes that way rather than have the landowner engage um, uh, a, an issue or a problem. Um, another thing is that landowners still have the ability to um, let their friends or family put up blind, uh, blinds or stands, permanent ones. So as a user, you might see uh, blinds or stands out there that, um, that have been allowed by the landowner. Mm -hmm. but, um, but you as a user who have no connection with that landowner are, not, uh, are generally encouraged to bring only portable uh, structures. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, those, those types of things, um, you know, if there are, are any issues, contact contact me or contact a warden if there are things that, that need to be settled. Mm -hmm. 
I think that's really important for people to know too. So, I wanted to add something sure. to that because I've talked with I've been getting chummy with Ann for months now. <laughs> yes, um, I I've been learning a lot about this program, and one of the things you'd said to me earlier was that the DNR actually backs up the land landowner if there's. I don't even know what example would be if there was some chronic thing that happened if somebody backed over a gate or something, I don't know, right. that the DNR would actually step in and help you. And I'm not sure how much help you would get, but I was like, oh, wow, I never even knew that they'd be doing that. Sure, yeah. So user, or excuse me, landowners can submit <coughs> damage claims um, for something that happens. They need to let us know within 10 days. And it has to be uh, because of a user, so mm -hmm. somebody coming out stealing something or like backing over a gate or doing something to a culvert or something like that um, on a parking area. So yes, we will review damage claims and, and help the landowner out in that situation. And then there's also sort of the liability protection. So if John went out to Kathy's property and uh, fell out of a, you know his portable blind or something like that, um, he couldn't sue you, <laughs> basically. <laughs> uh, landowners are protected. So. Um, one of the Wisconsin statutes basically protects uh, landowners uh, who open their land to public recreation. That's a great point because, you know, as a landowner, you might do a, you know, under the table handshake agreement, you know, for perhaps more money than you would get out of the VPA program. But out of that, you're not covered. Let's say the, the lease E falls out of a tree stand or something like you mentioned. Well, then, you know, you have a lawsuit on your hands. By going through the BPA program as a, 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 a user and a, well, not a user, but as somebody who's participating in it, you're covered. So I think that's a really appealing thing for, for participants. And, and that's definitely another thing for a landowner that may be on the fence about getting into the program that would, would hopefully put them at ease, too. So I think that's a really good point to bring up. The takeaway, I, I think, is that we have AM and we have Cheyenne, and we have the other liaison, so that every landowner has a direct point of contact that we encourage regular communication. So it's not sign the lease, send the check, and we're done. We are in regular communication and just a phone call away uh, to address any sorts of concerns that occur out on the property. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. John, did you want to add something there? Yeah, on the phone call, I've, I've called you guys as a user and as a volunteer, and... I've been amazed at the response I get. I'm, you're, it's usually within a business day. So if you do have questions as a user or a volunteer or as a landowner, I'd say give them a call because they, they get right back to you. Mm -hmm. So I was amazed by that myself. So speaking of resources available to a user, and you touched on this a little bit, but can you guys walk through just how easy it is to find a VPA property? Yeah, so there are a variety of ways uh, to find VPA properties. Uh, one is just by going to the VPA website again. So you search VPA on the dnr.wi.gov website. It'll take you right to our website. There is a section for users, and under there, there's find a property by county or find a property by interactive map. Uh, the county tables list all of the properties in chronological order. Um, they give you some information about what, what covers on the property, um, the, the public land survey system, a legal description, and then you can download a map directly from there. With the interactive map, you can do what you would do normally, zoom in, zoom out, scroll around the map, uh, type in a town, and you can see which properties are near you. When you click on one of the VPA properties, a little pop-up box will come up, and it'll give you some basic info about the property, and then you just click on the More Info hyperlink, and that'll take you directly to the map. So those are two ways to get information about our properties, where they're located. Um, there's a variety of other information, including the code of conduct and frequently asked questions on the website. But another tool you can use that John mentioned was the Public Access Lands Interactive Map, and that has pretty much every property that you could Tons access of information. Um, and it has a, a lot of information you can turn on and off aerial photos different layers and print out maps directly from that location as well and we'll, we'll share links to all these in the description as well so don't don't feel like you have to be scribbling down as you're listening uh, we'll point you in the direction of of the pals atlas the vpa web page uh, where you you'll find contact info for people like Ann if you have additional questions too so 
Uh, one thing we like to do with all these podcasts is when we get the opportunity to have these people with different perspectives at the table, we do kind of a, we call it the one thing question. We did a public lands hunting uh, where it was, what's one thing that's absolutely critical to a public lands hunt? So for this one, what I thought we'd do is, um, there are a lot of people out there who may not be familiar with the BPA program. So we'll start with you, John unless you need some time to think, but what is one thing that you would tell, you would tell someone who's not familiar with the BPA program? You're either you're in an elevator with them or, <laughs> or something like that. So what's the real high level, if you only had 20 seconds to talk to the guy, what, what would you tell him? Well, I, I could go t two ways with that. I, I know some landowners, and I've been knocking on doors trying to get them to enroll, and I've explained all the benefits. Um, but the one thing of my fellow hunters, some of them are, well, some of them don't have land to hunt on. So I tell them to go online and, and check this program out. I have a, a friend in Beloit, Wisconsin, and uh, I told him about it, and I, I must have got a text every 15 seconds. Well, what do you do to get the, the, the leaves back? And Because the, there's a color, mm -hmm. and then there's satellite view. Yep. So you can get a bunch of different views. So the one thing I... <laughs> I, I would say is check out, check them out, because you like to hunt and it's close by. Mm -hmm. So that's my takeaway. Just get your computer skills up to snuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a heck of a map. It's it just the more you learn, the more there is on it. So absolutely, Kathy, how about you? Well, as far as being a landowner goes, I I would just say do it. You know, if you if you think it, you've been thinking about it for a while. And you're like, eh, I don't know. I said, just do it. You know, if it's not your thing, then quit later. You know, but give it a shot. I, I do it. Cheyenne, how about you? Yeah, when I say about the VPA lands, just in general, is they're not quite widely as used as some of the state-owned lands. So if you're looking for a nice, quiet spot with not a lot of people, VPA lands is a place to go. That's a really good point. Until this podcast yeah. gets out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Anne, how about you? Uh, I guess I'd try to echo those those sentiments. I mean, they're really amazing properties. I've walked quite a few of them. Uh, the other day I was out near Allenton um, Wildlife Area in Washington County, I think, and I, I was actually training one of our new staff, and we saw turkey uh, prints all over the snow. And it was a really beautiful property kind of along uh, the river, and uh, we just... Uh, we just had a really nice time and a nice walk, and um, you know these are additional acres that are available to us. So go out and explore them. Mm -hmm. Tim, well, Ann stole mine a little bit, but <laughs> uh, what I want to say is we we focus a little bit today on people that don't own land and don't have private land for hunting, but I think that people that do own land um, would be missing an opportunity by not checking out VPA and that comment of explore. I think that there's something that gets added to a hunt or a fishing trip or looking for the new bird to check off your life list of going somewhere new. And that's part of life that's really exciting. So even if you own property um, out there, you could probably find a VPA that's open near you, might even be owned by one of your neighbors, and take, a, take that as an opportunity to explore someplace new. Eric? John, you hit on something earlier when you touched on social media. You said people are either hot or cold, and that kind of stuck with me because my job at DNR is I'm the social media coordinator. Truly a thankless job. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so I see all the, the you know negative comments that we get every now and then when we post something about BPA. And as a hunter myself, I just would almost like to kind of turn this question around back to other hunters. And if you are someone who's using these properties, take that take that ownership that you would onto you know your friend's land, your your family member's land, or land that you would own yourself, and bring that with you when you go out into the field. Because if if we can kind of start to you know truly live up to our stewards of the land, you know reputation that we like to you know pride ourselves on, mm -hmm. I think will make um, this a much better experience for people. Mm -hmm. That's deep. <laughs> so I guess I would just say that as a hunter in Wisconsin, we're incredibly lucky with the public land resources we have, and 
why would we not take an opportunity to continue to expand that? We've got wildlife areas, we've got things like that, but the VPA program is unique because it's up to us as users and as landowners, it can keep getting bigger. We don't always have that opportunity with wildlife areas and things like that, but it's kind of up to you as the hunter if you want more public lands you should absolutely be someone who supports VPA, who, who's willing to carry that, that type of message. And other, other thing, just briefly, is just do the right thing. Don't litter, um, don't break things, don't steal things. That shouldn't be unique to VPA. That should be, those should be things you're thinking about at all times. Things you learned in kindergarten. Exactly. Same, same applies. Exactly. So as a hunter, I like to think of myself as very in tune with conservation and that type of thing. Um, and any hunters, anglers or just wildlife viewers out there, um, I would encourage you to kind of just think about that every day. Do the right thing. So before we wrap up, does anyone have any, any closing thoughts? Yeah, I think I might just mention, you know, Wisconsin have a wealth of public lands, but, you know, the majority of the lands are still in private ownership. But our wildlife are everywhere. So it just provides or creates sort of this unique opportunity for landowners to get involved in the management of all of our, our wildlife species. And VPA uh, landowners um, do have uh, the option to install or create wildlife habitat on their properties through this program as well. So there's this habitat incentive portion of, of the program. Uh, we are actually right now on a wait list because we have had a lot of in interest in that. And we've gone through about 10 different projects so far on our landowner's land. So, that's one thing we do have. Uh, we are looking for additional funding to help with that aspect of the building habitat. So if you are interested in that, we have a suite of 17 different practices that we help fund. And um, you know, you could sign up now, get on a wait list, and um, as funds are available, we can help on projects as mm -hmm. well. So I think that's a, that's a really good closing thought. Um, so I would like to thank all of you guys for being here with us today, especially John and Kathy. I know you both traveled to be here, so we really appreciate it. I uh, look forward to staying in touch with you guys, especially Kathy, as you kind of keep navigating through being a landowner in the program. Um, for anyone looking for more information about VPA, you can go to dnr.wi.gov, keyword VPA. Um, you'll be able to find this podcast and all the other ones as well. We've got deer hunting, we've got sturgeon spearing, we've got all types of things. Um, at dnr.wi.gov keywords Wisconsin on our YouTube channel which is WIDNR TV or our iTunes or Podbean channels um, and always for, for things other than podcasts whether we're, we're walking a property with John or we're, we're with Kathy on her land uh, that's where Facebook, Instagram is going to come into play as well it's a lot of shorter videos um, we'll get you guys the links, links for more info for those as well so uh, thanks for joining us today we hope you guys learned some more about the VPA program. If you're a landowner, I hope it's really piqued your interest. Um, and if you're a hunter, angler, wildlife viewer, um, we hope this is a resource that you'll take advantage of to kind of keep exploring. So thanks for joining us.